This is Lance Armstrong. Welcome back to the Forward Podcast. Uh, Like I say every week, if anybody has any questions or comments or concerns or whatever you want to say, send me an email at theforwardpodcast at wedosport.com. Happy to uh, to hear from you all. Um, Been getting a bunch of international emails, which is is super cool. Um, So thanks for that. Hey, by the way, is it already August? Like that that just fucking bums me out, man. Like we're two thirds through the summer. It's just not right. You know? And I'm spoiled because I get to hang out in Colorado in the summer, and that means here in, you know, thirty days I'm back sweating my ball off in Austin. I love Austin and all, but man. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to make the most of it and, uh, enjoy this last month up here in the Rockies. What have y'all been up to? Anything, anything cool and interesting? We, uh, we got back from Ragbri, went straight into just a crazy week of events and friends and, and debauchery here, uh, around the house. Every summer we do, um, we do. You like that? Yeah. Every summer we do a, 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 a fundraiser that's actually at the house. Well, there, there's a, in the morning we do a ride and then in the evening we do a big dinner at our house for just an awesome young, um, eh, maybe not that young, but an awesome Colorado based organization called Wapi Api, which for those of you listening is W A P I Y A P I. And my better half, Anna, has been involved with Wapi Api for many, many years. She was a camp counselor originally, and then she uh, served a, a, a bigger role as, as a board member. Um, so Wapi Api is, is an organization that, that puts on summer camps, right? We all went to summer camp. But summer camps for kids with cancer and their siblings. So, um, um, you know, the, sort of that... that uh, brother sister bond there or brother brother bond whatever the bond is they do it in estes park They're, the organization's based in denver but the camp is actually in estes park this is a small organization you know their, their budget is um is is not big their staff is super tight and efficient and, and in one day between the ride and the dinner you know i want to say we do we might do half of of the entire annual budget and um Anyways, it, it's it's a great cause, a great organization, and and two, we just have a great time. Like people get super fucked up and bid on ridiculous auction items, and and you know everybody gets the mic at least once and says something crazy. Um, so that was that sort of that knocks us back. Right, the house is full. We fill up every room with friends and family that come in. Um, but if y'all get a sec, check out Wapi Api. Go to their website or, or um, some of their socials, and maybe it's your thing, maybe it's not. But um, it's obviously uh, very important to Anna and, and very important to me and very important to our family and um, great to be involved. This was, this was on, a, on a Saturday and a Saturday night. Our, my guest for this week, um, Ryan Bingham, was actually in Aspen playing Friday night, so I uh, I had the opportunity to um, to spend the day with him doing this podcast, and I'll get to his intro in a second. Um, um, but that but that just that that night was was out of control, like between doing the podcast and then having people over pre wapi um straight into um, went down to the the benefit for the local Aspen Ballet, which my one of my, my closest friend, Sheriff Joe DeSalvo, was dancing in the, their contest called Dancing with the Stars, which he actually won. We go to that, and then we ended up at Bingham, which was it was just awful. And but on that note, because I'm not, um, you know, I'm I'm a little wild and crazy when it comes to that. But I I just got a text about thirty minutes ago, and I don't. I, this is a good friend of mine. I don't know that his um, um, his situation is is a public situation, but he he was a big drinker. He this boy drank a lot, and and he drank a lot to the point where like people would be like, "Damn, he drinks a lot." And uh, he just and and when before I left Austin, we play golf a lot and talk a lot, and he said, "I'm gonna stop drinking." 
And he did. And it was one of these things where he was like, yeah, let's, go. let's see how this works out. Um, and I would check in with him every few weeks. And um, he says, yep, I'm on day 32. I'm on day 57. I'm on day whatever. And so he just sent me a picture literally 30 minutes ago of his, his six-month chip. And so pretty cool. To, I mean, not pretty cool. Very cool uh, to see that and to see somebody show commitment and just want to make themselves uh, a better better person, better friend, better dad, better member of society. So um, you know who you are. You know who I'm talking about. Um, I hope you're listening, but I'm proud of you. Um, and then, I mean, in and along those, uh, those issues, Ryan Bingham's life, had so much of that in it, and you. Once you listen to this hour, um, you'll you'll um, you'll come to understand. If you guys see when I when I um, the picture that's up there, that just the last thing before I get to Ryan, there, there's a little there's a little character in the uh, in the in the photo, which you guys will see um, uh, as you as as it, as it goes out. But there's a little character, a little a little sculpture that I just bought from an American artist. This is a guy named Jaime Molina. Um, I've never met him. I saw this piece uh, on the internet. It was he was doing a show at a gallery in Amsterdam. Um, I thought, my God, this thing's it's just something about this piece spoke to me. His name is this little piece. His name is the little guy. The character's name is Moco, and M O C O. So Moco's is appears in the photo and sits alongside Ryan and I for the podcast. But um, shout out to Jaime Molina because. Um, Dude, everybody loves this piece, and is, is and just to give you guys a sense for the photo might show it, but just to give you a sense, I mean, the entire piece sits less than a foot tall. I mean, it probably sits at more like nine or ten inches tall. Um, but this little steel, uh, this little nail head character, is just super cool. So he sits in with Ryan and I. Um, on to Ryan. Ryan Bingham. Um, is and as I go into or as I fully confess in the podcast is somebody that I'm just getting to really really appreciate, and this whole genre of singers and song singer songwriters and people, you know whether you go way back whether it's the Willie Nelsons or even this this gener maybe even a generation ago guys like Robert Earl Keane and Lyle Lovett, um, even you know going back further guys like Guy Clark which Ryan talks about. Um, this is an awesome genre in what I would consider to be almost a country and Western space. Um, but I, I've just stumbled across Ryan and, and, and love, love, love his music. He was coming here to Aspen playing at the belly up, which by the way is like super bitching club. If you ever get to go see a show there, you should. Um, and he was so gracious to come on. And, and as I, as I began to research him, I realized that this was not going to be your normal conversation that number one, just as, as, as most of y'all will, will come to hear and learn. This is the first podcast I've done with somebody that I had never talked to. So every other guest that we've done for five or six episodes, I know, I know those people. I would refer to them as a friend or I might refer to them as a good friend. I would talk to them for hours and hours and hours over the course of our lives. This guy walks in. I had never met Ryan Bingham. I had never talked to Ryan Bingham. I was super grateful that he came on. But the conversation that you will hear is our first conversation as uh, as new friends. And so that for me was was cool and challenging. I didn't I, you know, I didn't know what what his vibe was. I didn't know how that how the conversation would flow. I knew what I learned through the research. And I knew that this guy had a fucking really fucked up upbringing. And and I wanted to go there. I mean, I had I shit, I think I had a fucked up upbringing. Well, nothing compared to this and hats off to Ryan Bingham for just going there and singing about it. First time we've ever had anybody sing on the show. Um and so uh, I hope y'all enjoy it. He he's uh, and and by the way too, I should say. I mean the gig he the show he played at the Belly Up he burned the fucking place down, like it was out of control. It was a straight up rock show, um, and he he's in an an amazing he's in an amazing place. Um, got a new baby. He's got 
a new record and um and it's it's, it's so much well I won't say anymore. You just have to listen to it. But I think it's the place that he always wanted to be. So um, to my to my new friend and to the, a guy that I can't stop listening to, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, thanks to you all. Thanks to you all for checking in and, and, uh, and listening again. Ryan, thank you, man. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. I've, 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 uh, I've been, a, I've been, I'm a big fan. Um, but I haven't been a big fan. I've, I'm just new to it. I'm new to your stuff, and mm-hmm. I've seen you at those Willie things, and then uh, I've had friends all the time blowing me up, telling me I got to get in, into Ryan Bingham, and I'm just, I'm late to the party, bro. <laughs> oh, that's all, man. Thanks, I appreciate it. And so you guys are you 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 came into Aspen. You didn't play last night. You're here playing at the Belly Up tonight. That's right. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. How many how many times have you you played the Belly Up? We have, man. I think we've might have played. We've I think we've been here four or five times at least. Oh really? Yeah. Over the over the years. Yeah. It's been a great place. We always uh always really enjoy coming up here. It's always beautiful and the uh, the crowd's always really great. It's a great area. room. Like it's a it's a just the, at least for a from the fans perspective yeah. or the audience's perspective because there's no bad seat you can't mm-hmm. there's no columns or pillars or like everybody can see yeah and it's kind of you know whatever you call it, it's tier you know or it's mm-hmm. sort of tiered my up. sounds get in there it feels like too the sound it's is loud like, too yeah. loud as a motherfucker mm-hmm. that's right <laughs> which i don't know if you like but we <laughs> rock, like it rock show let's go yeah i do i like it loud and y'all loud, were just yeah. in i saw from your just your feeds you you just came back from europe and mm-hmm. and all over what was yeah that? we did we started uh we did a. Uh, we were there for a couple of two and a half weeks. Did played some festivals in Germany and Belgium, and went up to Scandinavia, and then back down to uh, Italy and, and finished in Spain. Just with the band, or you take the, to the band? band? Yeah, we did. I think the first half of it we did with the band. We played a lot, you know, kind of bigger festivals and things like that. And then the second half of it, we played some smaller kind of singer songwriter places, and we stripped the band down to a three piece where it was just a couple of guitars and a and a fiddle. And how many people? How, how big is the band tonight? Uh, we're a five-piece band tonight. We got full band rhythm you section. You plus four, or you plus me five. plus four. Yeah. In in Europe, like I'm always interested because you know you always see like the old like the big rock festivals, right? Those or yeah. even South America is a whole another whole another story. But mm-hmm. you know those old festivals in in Europe, people just out of control, right? Mm-hmm. Are they milder? Or are they crazy? I mean, man, it's really interesting over there. And and how does and sorry to interrupt, but right. how does well, I guess bro- your specific question: How does your music, you know, travel overseas, and then how does country music or, or singer songwriter music or, or however you define yourself, mm-hmm. you know, translate over there? It's it's interesting over there because uh, this idea of kind of country and Americana and folk and kind of uh, roots rock kind of gets molded into this one kind of genre over there i think people are just now over there it seems like fans are catching on there's a difference between like the americana roots music and like the maybe the top 40 nashville pop country coming right you know from there so it's taken us a lot longer to kind of you know establish a fan base over there just because i think people um record labels promoters etc just didn't really know what to do with us you know how to market us over there and, and how to kind of get us to that fan base you know i think you know, right off the bat, I remember my first two records, I was promoted over there as like a, a pop country artist from Nashville. Wow. So then when we, but, you know, there's different uh, perceptions feel, of that. Weird? So, Did you feel like you were acting or you were cool? Well, that? it just, it just slow. There's no, there were, there, the, there's not as big of a fan base for that kind of music mm-hmm. over there as there is here. And so people, um, there's actually a bigger fan base for more of the kind of roots, rock and roll and Americana kind of music that we play. And so it just kind of took a while, I think, for fans to find us over there. And you play yeah. Italy, right? I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. they speak Italian, and yeah. not many Italians speak English. And mm-hmm. so you're there. Like, are they – and your your music is so little. I mean, it's literally word for – like, you can – at least from my perspective, mm-hmm. you can understand and relate to every word, whereas some Italian dude going – It's interesting there, too. You know, right. that's one of the best the, – the, the, we're kind of – did. Did well there. The very first time we went to Europe, they we had got a big write up in a 
rock and roll magazine over there called Buscadero. And this was like the first record that I'd, had come out here in the States on Lost Highway. And we were still playing like two and 300 seat clubs here in the States. Yeah. And we fly over to Italy and we're playing like a 1500 seat venue that sold out and, and just had this huge fan base there. We didn't even know it, you know? So huh. it was really interesting you get to kind of go walk right into that and, nice and have surprise. a crowd. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it goes over fairly well and, um it's been growing over there too it's been kind of slowly but surely but every time we go back you know we're playing bigger venues and, wow. and people see, keep coming so i don't know we just and now you're now you're doing colorado where well, you do colorado mm -hmm. i know you're in austin in a few weeks so this is like a little yeah. how long is this this past um this is just four four gigs up here in colorado and then we have one show in texas uh last summer we came up here for like two and a half weeks and we did a kind of the mountain run summer right. festivals and we started and uh, I think we started in Boise, Idaho. We went through Montana and Jackson Hole and then now Colorado. And we were trying to do that again this year. Um, but just some scheduling stuff came up. So we had to cut it short to only a few shows here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. But I've been, we just had such a good time doing it last year just to be in this part of the world during the summer in the mountains and yes. playing you know, these outdoor festivals. I was like, man, we ought to do this every year in the summer. Just keep coming up here and playing um, these shows just because we enjoy it so much. Yeah. yeah. No, man. I mean, in the summer, mm -hmm. you know, well, we're both from Texas. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's I mean, a thousand degrees down yeah, it's, there. It's, and it's <laughs> hot and it's more humid than, yeah. than you think or want to think mm -hmm. and that people think. And it's it's just miz. So yeah. to get an escape and get up here. I really enjoyed just kind of the backcountry aspect. I really love to camp and to fish and hike and all of that stuff, too. So I kind of working towards this idea where, you know, I can maybe come up and play some gigs and then stay for another few days right. and go camp or get into the back country and things like that. So I just really camper. enjoy being I, in I nature. I too. Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> it's a joke. You out of, my friends and my family. I end up here on those long I'm rides such, camping I'm on the I'm such way. a wuss. It's, I mean, <laughs> I camp like at the, you know, the nice hotel and the nice, I'm such a fucking wuss when it comes to camping. I can't do it. There's, you don't even have bugs up here, though. There's no, well, no, there's no bugs. This summer's been <laughs> buggier than normal, but, but, ah. And so you, but now you live in LA. You live in. I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that ain't bad. No, nah, it's, you, you know, know. You live in Malibu? I live in Topanga Canyon. Oh, you do? In between, yeah. I used to ride up there all up in, the time. Up in Hippie Canyon, yeah. How far up? So you go, I mean, you hang, I'm, like, from PCH, you hang that right, you go up mm -hmm. to Topanga, and then you've got the first, you've got the little. A town or village or I'm right there close to the village on old Topanga and then the fire road. station on the left yeah about halfway that's right where i am like if you go up to old Topanga and you go down that road i'm right down there oh that's killer mm -hmm. i love it man it's it's kind of crazy it's you're up in the middle of that state park and you know you're such so close was that to, roy rogers the roy rogers stuff it's topanga state park topanga there state park. yeah and um so when you're up there you just feel like you don't feel like you're in los angeles you, yeah it's, it's a lot you know a lot of nature and and wildlife running around no once so, you get back people escape. don't realize mulholland goes all the way out to pch so you mm -hmm. can go from topanga cut over get up to stunt get over to mulholland yeah. and then all of a sudden you're up there yeah yeah you'd have no idea that you're in the middle of one of the largest city maybe the largest city in the world I yeah guess. it's crazy ain't, ain't bad mm -hmm. and what so when you went out there was is your wife from there no um but i met her there my wife's originally from germany and uh, she oh, had really? moved out like to Los Angeles. German. She's real German, yeah, yeah, wow. real deal German. And um, <laughs> we met out there, and just you know, that was it. She, we, we uh, I wasn't really living anywhere at the time. I was living out of a suburban and kind of camping out between L.A. and Texas, yeah. uh, going back and forth, you know, playing gigs and just kind of on the couch tour. And met her out there, and and I uh, just stayed. Yeah, and we started a the um, family out there because I, you know, when when I do these, I try to learn up and i mean i've been like i said i was late to the party but just really digging your music the last year and then just learning as much as i could and it's just interesting to see and you never know what's true and what's not true it's yeah. bullshit on the internet but you know i mean you know where somebody's born you know where they kind of went to high school and i mean you were mm -hmm. all over the place born in new mexico i even looked up mm -hmm. hobbs new mexico which is mm -hmm. Like somebody's from there, something from there. There's <laughs> nothing not, from there. Hardly anybody. Yeah, there is nothing from Hobbs, New Mexico. Yeah, I moved around a lot. I my my uh, my family was a ranching family out there. My grand my great granddad homesteaded out there, and they had sheep and cattle ranch out there forever. And they family sold that ranch right when I was born, right soon after. And 
there wasn't really anything else to do out there but work in the oil fields. So everybody, my, my father and uncles, they all went and worked in the oil fields and then just kind of started moving after that, you know, kind of migrantly yeah. moving to these different towns in West Texas, down South Houston, Laredo, even out to Bakersfield, California for a bit when I was younger. Wow. With and, both your parents? Yeah. And then uh, when I was, I think I was that some in, I mean, really. five or six, moved to Bakersfield. It ain't like you're going to back. Laredo and Houston and West Texas and Bakersfield. Both, I mean, oh man, yeah, it's, it wasn't really cool places to move. <laughs> and this Not is your and you're how out. old doing? Well, I think we moved to. I'm really, I get really bad with the timeline stuff, but uh, probably six or seven. That's because when we you've moved, moved so many times, yeah. you can't even put it together. You can't. Yeah. Well, I don't think we lived in the same house longer than a year. Even if we just stayed in that city or town, you know, we were like in Houston for like three years, but we would probably lived in four or five different houses. Brothers and sisters? One sister older. And she was, yeah. I mean, the whole crew, four of y'all just. Whole thing, yeah. Well, it started, a lot of it was, you know, we were younger and uh, went to Bakersfield, California, and then back to Texas, and then just all over Texas and New Mexico. And about the time, you know, I was 15, 16, she was, she was, she's a couple years older than me. We had enough of it, you know, so we are like. We just kind of went our own ways, and you and your split. sister, yeah. She, I think, she drew the line. I think we were in Houston, and we moved again to Laredo, and I went to Laredo, and she's <laughs> she'd had enough. She's How like, old I'm was staying she? Here. She was 18, and you were. I was 16, and you tapped out too. Yeah, that is tapped amazing. Out. I made it to Laredo for, and then it was just kind of like Laredo. It's just it's it's south of San Antonio, down there on the border of Texas yeah. and Mexico, and it's a pretty wild place. You know, we were down there. Kind of before the drug stuff was getting really too bad, you right. know. You could still get down into Mexico fairly easy, but um, it was a wild west down there. And yeah, kind of had to hang on. And does Houston really <laughs> bring you down? You said what you said in what is it in Bread and Water? Houston, Houston gets me down. <laughs> it did then, you know, when I wrote the but song. Now, I, I mean, think, Houston now, gets me down. Like, city, I, yeah. I no offense to Houstonians, and if anybody <laughs> yeah. from Houston is listening, but that is that is, I, I'm not down with Houston. Yeah. It's big and there's traffic and it's hot and humid. And I didn't really, it's not like I really lived in a very nice part of Houston either. You know, I was living in the slums. So it was, yeah. you know, it was just a rough time there. I was in my early teens and shit was really fucked up in my family. My parents were all over the place. And, and it was just a tough city to be kind of lost in and young and hmm. really poor and in a bad part of town. And, you know, a lot of gangs, a lot of violence, God. a lot of stuff and it was just and uh, you had not started playing music at no that time. i just moved there from west texas you know we'd come from uh i think we moved there from midland texas uh you know small west right. texas town and all of a sudden thrown into a big city like that in houston and i think i was a freshman in high school you know going from a fairly small school and then getting blown into that big city i remember like the first day of school i think i walked in and they had probably I don't know, it felt like 20 police officers had about 30 people handcuffed on the floor of the cafeteria because they had a big gang riot that morning. You're and, like, you where? Know, what the fuck It was is just this? like, welcome to town, you know? I was like, all right, better buckle up. So, um, and that was like, it, it, that was like, it was like that. A lot of places we moved, you know, especially those rough kind of Woolfield towns in West Texas, yeah. you know what I mean? And your folks, I tough. mean, it's, it's, it's on your, you know, your, your bio and stuff. I mean, your, your mom, was not healthy. She mm -hmm. drank, I guess, too, a lot or too much. Yeah. Yeah, both of them were severe alcoholics, and drug addicts. And oh. So it was just... And you knew that at the time, or you... You know, that... At some point, I mean, at some they, point... They always kid. loved to party, you know, we knew it growing, growing up, but it didn't, wasn't until, you know, we were in our teens and kind of we started seeing, realizing, you know, that it wasn't really... That, party and they're yeah, not just party yeah there was a lot more to it you know than just that and and, the, and then it just you know you realize why we had to move all the time and a lot of stuff started making sense you know of why we were getting shuffled around so much is they just couldn't hold jobs down you know and they'd get laid off or fired and we'd have to pack up and move or you know things like that electric you know you, you always knew that it was, we were about to move whenever the electricity got turned off and we we're heating up beans in a pot on a gas <laughs> fire, you know. Yeah, <laughs> propane stoves. I so. mean, life is messy, but man, that mm. is super messy. It was kind of strange because it was felt like it was concealed a lot of it to where, you know, my parents did a good job of kind of hiding it, you mm -hmm. know, and so kind of growing up, we kind of it almost just seemed normal, you know. It's like, well, everybody must live this way. We just yeah. happen to move a lot because Dad's always getting transferred from one job to the next, but then. You know, you start realizing 
that the drugs and alcohol were coming into play and that was the reason they were losing their jobs and this was the reason why we were broke or whatever and uh drug you mean like real drugs or just yeah um, you know Mar- not pot. smoke and coke and pills you know all <sighs> that, of that's it. real drugs yeah real drugs yeah well man i'm i mean obviously you, you've turned out all right so that, <laughs> i'm still no, working but, on but it nobody, yeah. <laughs> but here you know the cool thing mean, you talked about your wife i know you got a new yeah. before we came on we talked about your baby girl mm. you got and i always look at it like my life was wasn't anything like that mm. but it wasn't like some shit that was on you know leave it to beaver or anything like, yeah you know it was it was messy enough mm-hmm. that, and now I got all these kids and I'm like, all right, but, but now we, you got a chance to, to kind of write that history and that's mm-hmm. which you probably feel with, you know, yeah. your own family. And oh, I totally look at it that way. And you know, a lot of it's, and, and, you know, I've, I've talked about this some kind of friends and, you know, my parents had their problems for sure, but you know, they really weren't bad people. You know, they mm-hmm. weren't, it's not like they didn't love us or didn't try to take care of us. You know, my mom was hilarious. She had the, funniest personality and was really cool my dad was the kind of guy that would just give anybody the shirt off his back and um well no that but that's and all of that it was just like they got caught up in the wrong stuff and sick. couldn't get I back mean, that, that is yeah. you know i mean it, i guess back maybe back then or before you know people would have looked down i mean that's not a you know somebody i mean that's that's a disease that's an illness yeah. and so you it is what it is and but i think as we progress in society you you look at things through that lens right and mm-hmm. that's you don't just say, oh, these fucking people doing this. I mean, you have to realize that people get trapped. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. but, the, but they're not evil. They're not bad. And nobody's out, Yeah, you know, not hanging and out with Charlie Manson. Right? About, yeah, the word, they're kind of the part of the world they were from, you know, small kind of West Texas town, Eastern New Mexico. They were, uh, you know, my mom, my dad was a state champion, quarterback at the high school. Uh, mom was the, their homecoming queen and king, you know, all that whole deal. And, um had kids when they were super young and didn't really have a plan and just got caught up caught up in all of that stuff and um and how old were they you're because you're now what 35 i'm 35 yeah and so there were you know we leave it in laredo and you're 15 or something so yeah they, they passed 16. away when you were they passed i think gosh i i blocked so much out of that that out of my we mind. don't have to I go mean, there like yeah. in my early 20s yeah you know, they passed away but in the meantime at some point you you do some rodeo circuit or if you believe mm-hmm. what you read i mean yeah yeah I, I grew up doing that really i'm not, my family was a you know they ranched out there in new mexico and my uncle rode bulls professionally we're not talking up, like my kids go to the rodeo and mm-hmm. they do like the mutton busting and like chase the thing we're not talking that kind of no rodeo. it's like junior rodeo it's like thing. roping and riding and riding steers and all of that stuff when i was a kid you know uh, my uncle got me into taking me to these junior rodeos riding steers and um my grandfather took me for a while when they couldn't and my dad and mom all took us so um i did that and rode in high school and into college and even got my pro card for a couple of years riding bulls wow and that's how i got into playing music really i mean performing i was uh at the time i was down in laredo learned how to play the guitar and then, and then from there i'd moved up around uh a little town called Stephenville, Texas, outside of Fort Worth. Oh yeah, where the co- where is uh, all the Cowboys live? What's yeah. the what's the college there? Uh, Tarleton State. Tarleton State. Mm-hmm. My but you know we were talking about Will Coryeth, yeah, who owns Whitewater, yeah, the auditorium or the uh, the uh, amphitheater in in New Braunfels. His brother mm-hmm. John Coryeth, who's one of my tightest buddies, he went to uh, Tarleton State. Oh, did he? I, I went there too. I got ended really. Up, like it was funny when I was younger. There was a they had a junior rodeo in Stephenville, and I won the junior bull riding there, and. um the rodeo coach for the college at the time, Bob Doty, was there, and he told me, he said, man, if, when you graduate from high school, come talk to me, you know, if you ever want to huh. come ride bulls for the team, and I never thought about it. You know, Wait, this that's like a scholarship I, sport at Tarleton State? Yeah. They have I mean, like that's, you learn team. something every it's day. Like athletics, yeah, it's part of like the athletic department thing. Really? Yeah, they, like intercollegiate rodeo association, and um, and this was before I moved to Houston, anything, you know, I was... 14 or 15 years old and never thought about it never thought that i'd ever even end up back in stephenville you know and then all of a sudden i end up back there living and i'm hanging out and i dropped out of school at the time and um but i was riding bulls and i'd ran back into bob Doty, and he remembered me and he said well if you go back to high school and and graduate i'll you know see what i can do to help you out to get you you know get you here That's to carlton cool. <laughs> and uh i went and enrolled in high school there in stephenville finished my senior year and then he helped alone me out. no parents no 
yeah, pretty much alone. My dad was around, and my, my mom and dad were still around, but they were just they were kind of out of the picture. But they lived in. I mean, you didn't live yeah. alone. You didn't live in a house alone. No, I lived. Yeah. Uh, actually, I moved in with this guy that was a rodeo photographer that used to take pictures at all these junior rodeos. A guy named Dudley Barker I was living there in Stephenville, and I moved in with him for a bit, and uh, and then from there just kind of lived with friends. And then from there, I was kind of out of my own. I got some roommates. And, and when you're on the rodeo circuit again, this is stuff you read. I mean, you're doing the circuit and sleeping in your car and. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. Bro. I loved it, man. You know what I mean? Every weekend. I loved it. He says off. I loved Like, if I slept one night in the car, <laughs> I would be I'd be in the fetal position, fucking, mm -hmm. like, just bought, like, I'd, I'd have to be yeah. put in a home. I'd be so upset. But for me, it was just the safest place for me at the time I felt, you know, because everything was so crazy, you know, with my parents and that whole situation, like. Being around my friends on the road in a vehicle, that was like being around a family of like family. people I could trust. Yeah, you know, name, I yeah. felt more safe out on the road with that's these friends God. and then, you know, than I did when I was anywhere else. So I just that's all I wanted to do was stay gone and stay on the road. And I think that's why when the music stuff came into it, it just I was like, Yeah, let's and go. And you started so you're out on the circuit and you know, so you've got a guitar, you're just picking along. I mean, mm -hmm. passing time. I guess you must have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And 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 figured it out yourself, I guess you didn't. Yeah, I, all I, all I knew was one song from Laredo. This guy taught the, me this the mariachi, mariachi song tune yeah. down there called the La Malagueña, and I just got so sick of playing it. I you know I got me a book of chords, of guitar chords, and started teaching myself different guitar chords. And I would take my guitar along to these rodeos, and I'd sit in the back seat of the truck, and we'd make up silly songs going down the road about our adventures on the weekends, and. Um, there in Stephenville one day, we'd come back off the road from these from rodeo, and there was a little bar we'd go to there called the Water Hole, and it was a little bar on a nine hole golf course there. Oh, I like it. And they just had like a little all, pool table all this stuff. and yeah. just a you know little bitty hole in the wall bar. And we walked in there, and I don't I, was, I wasn't even old enough to be in the bar, but my buddies were at the time, and they always snuck me in there, and nobody ever asked any questions. And, right. Uh, the guy that owned the bar was hanging out, and my buddies uh, taught me into bringing my guitar into the bar and playing a song at the bar. And I played, and the, the bar owner said, man, you ought to come in here and do a gig sometime, you know, just play. <laughs> I was like, really? He's like, yeah. And so I think the you next Wednesday. Think, you he, ought to thank that guy. Yeah, he got me in there, and we set up a tip jar. And um, I'd go, I only knew like two or three songs, you know. I'd just play for 30 minutes or however right. long and play some pool, and then maybe I'd get up and play a little bit more. And that's and then I just... And then you knew you were going to yeah. be a star then, man. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Long way from being that. But uh, a guy that was real critical at that time was a guy named Mac Altizer that I met that had a rodeo company out of Del Rio, Texas called Bad Company Rodeo. And I'd been to some of his rodeos competing, and um, they are always just really fun, cool rodeos to go to. It was always the biggest party around. And um, I'd met Mac somewhere along the way, and uh, – I just went in and talked to him one day about, you know, if I could help work for him or, you know, if I could play some music at the, one of the rodeos. And he was just all about it. He hooked me up to play in the, like the hospitality tent for the Cowboys after the rodeos. Yeah. And I just started working for him and he kind of sponsored me in a way. And uh, a couple of my buddies would, were working for him too. It was kind of, we kind of, we called it the orphanage in a way. He was just Mac. He didn't have any kids. And he kind of just took in all of us kind of ramble and scramble <laughs> kids and, kind of gave us something to do and kept us busy and That's so cool. gave us a bit of a purpose. So I, I really give a lot of credit to, to Mac, too, for helping me get us started. And this playing. is in the early 2000s. Yeah. So, I mean, you're not that far from, I mean, Mescalito's 07. Yeah, this was. Which yeah. was, oh, Crazy Heart was, when was great? Crazy Heart was. 09. 09. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, you think about that from, from the early 2000s to, bumming around with mac and at the water mm -hmm. hole and in stephenville and and then shit five or six years later it's it's on it happened pretty quick yeah, yeah. it's so quick that i didn't i didn't know what to do with it at right. all but that's yeah. right i mean that's yeah. i look back on my stuff and i'm yeah. but well, how could you i don't think you can ever be right no i mean yeah. or can no. you i don't know <laughs> no and you don't maybe you don't want to be yeah. that person yeah. that's that seems so prepared like i'm a i'm gonna be a star and here's <clears throat> Here's the way I'm gonna roll, and yeah, I mean it's got to be. It, I guess you have to keep it kind of. Um, so you have to. It has to be a surprise. 
but that must have been a surprise for you. I mean, I mean, yeah, that's definitely a shock. <laughs> what was it? And, and you mentioned playing songs, so I know, and I and we've never had. I've I had Ben Harper on the podcast mm-hmm. a few weeks ago, um, but I've never had anybody. He didn't play because we were at Red Rocks backstage. It was loud, and the kitchen <clears> was right through the wall. But but I know you brought your guitar and you were playing. Mentioned playing songs. So it, it'd be cool if you yeah. you know ripped one or two. But uh, um. Let's do one now. You want to do one now? Yeah, let's do one let's now. Let's play one. Let me. You and you play. Let's well, play whatever you want to play. To be honest, but what are you gonna play us? Let's play. A, this was called "Diamond Is Too Rough." Here. They tell me they look upon my skin and bones You're ragged and you're dirty Hardly worth your weight in gold For all of your suffering No one gives a good goddamn It's all about the money, son We doubt you understand Your only hope They say my diamond is too rough Your only hope I'd never trade it for their love Sometimes at night I look upon the stars above They never shine as bright As my diamond in the rough People, they tell me Just to give up and go on home But to have no home to go to It's something they'll never know Your only hope They say my diamond is too rough Your only hope I'd never trade it for their love Sometimes I feel Like I ain't getting nowhere I'm walking down that road This burden I can't bear But I'll never let this world Get too heavy on my shoulders My diamond always will Pull the weight that I'm under Your little They say my diamond is too rough Your little hope I'd never be traded for their love Whoa! <laughs> well, man. That's amazing, dude. Thanks, man. <laughs> I mean... <clears throat> Golly, I wish I could do that. <laughs> you know, like I people always give me instruments, and I mean, I can play play simple shit on the drums. But God, if I could just pick like that and do that. But are you saying I just googled the lyrics here because I just caught this because we were just talking about home and and what home was for you? And you say, people they tell me just to give up and go on home, but to have no home to go to is something they'll never know. I mean, that's your life. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Till now, anyway. Well, no, now you, now you, you got a home now. I got one now. Yeah. Don't screw it up. <laughs> That's right. We're guys. We always try to fuck it up. <laughs> That's right. I know I do. Wow. 
That is amazing, man. All right, that's a, we got to we got to start asking people to play their guitars on the on the yeah, forward podcast. Yeah. Um, tell me about Crazy Heart and what that was all about. I, I've you know, I must confess, as I confess to being late to your party, I'm sort of late to the singer songwriter country and western party. I mean, I was Willie's a good friend of yeah. mine. I always loved Willie's music, and I just watched Crazy Heart for the first time. Mm-hmm. Shit, I watched it on a flight about three weeks ago. Okay. I'd never watched it. Yeah. And he was an amazing movie. He wins the Academy Award. You win mm-hmm. the Academy Award. And, um, but I mean, that must have been a killer process. I mean, a great career move, obviously, but a, but a cool process. I don't know how much you had to be around. Yeah. Or... It was, does does yeah. Bridges play and sing? Yes, he does. Yeah. And, uh, he's great, man. He, um, you know, I, I originally... It looked and it I mean, you got the impression he was yeah. playing and singing. Yeah, he's played for a long time. Yeah, he, he, He's a really good guitar player and a lot of fun to hang out with and play music. I don't know if you've ever met him or not, mm-hmm. but, uh, I mean, wonderful guy. He was probably, out of that whole thing, the greatest part was getting to meet and hang out with him. Yeah. Like, even, like, more than winning the Oscar and all that yeah. stuff. Like, that's... I mean, it's all awesome. It was all great. It was all a blast, but... Um, and that was in... He was twelve, really or great. 2012, 20, 2012, 20, no, two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Yeah. So you go mescalito. I think so. I think so. <laughs> we should know all this. You yeah. should know all this. I should, stuff. but I don't. Yeah. But you go mescalito, crazy heart. I mean, and this, you're just thinking shit. I had two. I had two records on Lost Highway out, and I was still, you know, we were. I was in a van touring around with the band, playing kind of punk rock clubs mm-hmm. and hole in the wall honky tonks and dive the bars wherever horses. I could. Yeah, that was with the dead horses. The dead horses. Yeah, and uh, I. I had an agent at CA. Uh, well, he wasn't really my agent. He was he, he kind of he was a a guy that I'd met that was a movie agent over there. He represented actors and stuff. And a guy named Jack Wiggum. And that's he, the dude I emailed about getting you on here. Yeah, it says Jack. He writes me, but did you know the story? So I no. Huh, well, I was no. like, I saw you were coming to the yeah. belly up, and I said, I'm getting, I'm getting Bingham on the podcast. So okay. I started emailing, you know, whoever and Willie's manager. Okay, Mark gave me. Uh, um, Jack's, Jack's email okay. so I email him and it he don't write back huh and then like five days later he's like oh sorry I've been down in the Bahamas with Jim <laughs> yeah. Toth who's another agent yeah. at CAA yeah. that's the two yeah and I'm like oh that's rough <laughs> exactly. sorry ass and so he said he said I'll have Ryan or his wife call you and so that uh-huh. was I was like hell yeah he kind of you know really started a lot of stuff man I I, I was playing in the canter place called the Cantor's Deli it's uh or the Kibitz Room it's right there on Fairfax and Hollywood a long time ago. It was way before, our, I think I was even signed to Lost Highway. And uh, he just happened to be in the bar. And he came up to me after I'd played and he said, I don't know shit about music. He's like, I, I'm, uh, I work in the mail room at CAA. Like, he's yeah. like, I don't know what I'm going to do because I want to do <laughs> like something to help start. you. Yeah. He's like, I want to help you out. <laughs> and he just kind of was just my biggest fan and, you know, was always sending my music to people and trying to bring shows, people to my shows. And, he called me and, and and wanted me to meet Scott Cooper, the guy that was directing and wrote Crazy Heart. And right. uh, he's like, man, there's this cool film. I just got a good feeling about it. You should meet, you should go have lunch with this guy. I went and met Scott for lunch. Scott told me about the film and that T-Bone Burnett was going to yeah. produce the music for I mean, it. Yeah, and Jeff the man. Duvall were going to be in it. And you know, I was just flattered just to hang out and have He's like, man, I'm just a fan of your music. If you'd like to take a shot at writing a song, you know, here's this copy of the script, you know? And uh, I went on the road. We were on like a two or three week tour. And uh, I remember being in the back seat of the van and I'd read, read the script. And I started writing the song, just rolling down the road in the back of the van up in, I don't think we were in like uh, North Dakota or something, just out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And um, got home and I recorded a demo of the song. And I called Scott and I said, hey, I... Uh, I've got this song I'd like to send you in the mail and see what you think about it. For the he, movie. Yeah, for the film. For the movie Crazy Heart. He said, well, what are you doing right now? And I said, well, I'm sitting at home. And he goes, well, I'm in L.A. He goes, well, why don't you just bring it over to me? And I said, okay, where, where are you? Bring the tape or bring, bring your the guitar? Bring the CD. Okay, yeah. yeah. Bring like a, the demo over the tape. And I said, yeah, where are you? He goes, I'm at T-Bone Burnett's house. And uh, it's right here in Brentwood or wherever. And, and uh, so I drove down there from Topanga. But you were well aware who T Bone Burnett was. Yes, yeah, you're thinking, oh fan. shit, yeah, yeah what you this know. is about to get. Yeah, I was, you know, just I was like, this is amazing. You know? Nervous, you must have been nervous. Really nervous. Yeah, good. And I, I will get to the house and I knock on the door and 
you know, T-Bone's like seven foot he's tall. Huge. Big guy. Yeah. He answers yeah. the door. He's got his sunglasses on. He's looking down at me, and I got I'm standing there with this tape in my hand, you know. He goes, oh, hey, Ryan. He goes, come on in. We were waiting on you. And I walk in the house, and there's like 30 people in the house. Oh, my God. Jeff Bridges, Robert Duvall, oh. Buddy Miller, like all these songs, Stephen Bruton, like all these music supervisors okay. for the films. And T-Bone walks straight over to the stereo and puts the demo tape in. And this is something I just what, recorded. You, like didn't on have, you, didn't, you need a track. cocktail. You didn't yeah. even have time to get a cocktail. Uh -uh. This is like at 3 in the afternoon. Oh, okay. You know? Well, still, you need I'm like, cocktail. yeah, I needed one. And uh, he puts on the song right away. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, he li everybody listens to the song. I listened to it all the way through, and then it ended. And he goes, "Man, I think that might work." <laughs> and he goes, "Can you play it for us live on the couch?" And he handed me a guitar, and, and oh. uh, I was like, "Yeah, I'll play it." And I sat down on the couch and played the song. And, and you can just sit down and do that. Well, I, I didn't know I could at the time, but I just but you for did. It, you know, I had to reach down for those old rodeo habits you know and <laughs> try to pull one out of the hat yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> wow yeah he said and from then on he's like that's where that's it that's gonna be the song and let's do it let's go and you win so you win a golden globe and you win <clears throat> the academy award for that song mm -hmm. you accepted the academy award mm -hmm. and you missed the golden the globe golden globe yeah i missed the golden globe somebody yeah. told me that I, I find that i mean i was like <laughs> he did what <laughs> well, i can blame this one on jack wiggum again too and jim toth by a matter of fact uh, see, at the Golden Globes, it was all arranged seating and everything, and you couldn't yeah, take a guess or all anything. It was just terrible. <clears throat> and I'm sitting at this table. I don't know anybody there, and the <laughs> show hasn't even started yet, and nobody's talking to me. You know, they're just everybody's whatever. It's Hollywood, you know? yeah, right. doing the and that's schmoozing just... bullshit. And I'm bored. I'm just sitting there at this table, and I get a, a text message from Jack, and he goes, "Hey, man," he goes, "I'm at the bar with uh, Colin Farrell and." Um, couple other jim toth and uh who else somebody else he goes anyway he's like come over to the bar and have a beer with us i'm like okay i get it well the bar is all the way on the other side of the room or other side of the building in another room and i walk as soon as i walk into the bar and get a beer and we look up there's a tv and they announce that we win the golden globe <laughs> and t-bone's up there all by himself and i'm going like oh shit like Oh, They're like you're winning dude. the award right now. Like you got, you're supposed to be. Is up he there. looking for you? Is he? Is oh yeah, he's everybody's going... looking for me, and Timo's looking for me, and I and like I'm just like, but there was no way I could have made it, you know, to run all the way. I was just like, man, whatever, it is what it is, you know. And uh, is luckily, such... Timo was a pretty good sport about it. He that's laughed, like... but he he gave me shit about that for <laughs> for a but while. But it's, it's a good story. I mean, that's <laughs> God, the highlight of your your career i guess at that point and you're yeah because the globes are before it's before the yeah, oscars yeah. it's like a little warm-up mm -hmm. well you, it you, was I, pretty you, funny and then the you know <laughs> the oscars rolls around and your ass wasn't moving you were just sitting right there like yeah I'm not, i don't care if they had a couple nobody's people talking to like, me i don't like care security. what i'm not moving <laughs> yeah. i'll be right here i think the studio actually hired a couple of people to like follow me around and make sure that Do I they, you don't know you win yeah. right i mean it's it is a surprise no yeah I you don't know, know. This, but, uh -uh. No, so you don't know. And you beat out it was probably some, you know. It was pretty. Know. It was it was wild. Yeah. You like Austin? You like going to Austin? I do like Austin. I love Austin. I'm from Austin. Was a really good town. Yeah, that was. You played a lot time. in Austin. Mm -hmm. I don't think I. You know, I mean, that's really where I got my start. Was playing music, and I don't think I. I don't think there's any other city in the country I could have done what I had done. You know, without starting there. Yeah. You know, just the support there. For young songwriters and people playing and then the amount of places to play like open there's a mm -hmm. bar a cafe or somebody's back porch you can play every night and it really taught me a lot you know it gave me a chance to play and sing through a microphone and then yeah. we got a back porch know. so anytime you're just yeah. bored and you're in austin <laughs> i'm just, ready you bring me hey lance yeah. i'm really really <laughs> bored yeah no it's it's you ever think about moving there I have, man. It's it's it's. Uh, I mean, you you got a good setup, but I mean, yeah. a lot of people think of if think I, if about, I went anywhere else, I'd I'd probably go back somewhere around Austin. I really like around out in the hill country. Yeah, up there, somewhere between there. You don't rodeo Central. anymore. You no, I, I ride horses. What if somebody yeah. strapped up some bull? Could you get on it and? No, uh, I mean maybe I could, but I don't. I don't really have have Man, the those desire guys must anymore. Get jacked yeah. up too, you know. Yeah, I still got some friends doing it and uh, watch a lot of the younger guys doing it. So I, I enjoy going and and watching, being around it. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, no, out, just out west of Austin, and you know, Austin's just 
you, but you know this. I mean, you've mm-hmm. been there enough recently. It's just exploded. But that anywhere west of there, whether it's Stripping Springs or or, or Kerrville or Fredericksburg, yeah, or, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, I and really that's love still it you know you can still although towns move in that way, right? I mean, Austin's, mm-hmm. which is what happens. Yeah, but for now, it's still. I had a ranch out in Dripping Springs for a long time, mm-hmm. and it was ended up not going. You know, kids get older, and then the weekends are sporting events, and yeah. you know, then they get older. They want to hang with their friends. It's like let's go to the ranch. It's like, no, we don't want to go. And then you're like, all of a sudden, you've got this great place you never go, and yeah. you kind of have to live there if you're going to mm-hmm. use it because they're not getting in the car to go an hour from yeah, Austin out just to, for the weekend or whatever. Yeah, you know. you'll learn all this stuff when that yeah. little, when you get that little. <laughs> What was it? Because you were with the Dead Horses for a long time. I was, yeah. For, I mean, almost your whole career. And then y'all, you, mm-hmm. you guys split up and then back together. Yeah. And now you're not out with the Dead, the Dead no, Horses. No, it's all now. different guys. Yeah, all different guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that's a good. And it was interesting because I did when I did Ben Harper a few weeks ago. He did a very similar thing. So he had Ben Harper and in the Innocent mm-hmm. Criminals for a long, long time. And he just basically took a hiatus and said, let's just take a break. Yeah. And he, he did some solo, you know, his own stuff. He did stuff with the Relentless 7. And, and then he put this last tour, which I just saw him at Red Rocks. He had the Innocent Criminals back together again. Mm-hmm. Um, but that must be tough, man, having these guys that are kind of rode it up and then they're off yeah. and then they're back. And It is, man. And it was sad. You making know, we those, all Making both up. of those calls, yeah. like. It wasn't e- it wasn't easy for me either, and it was I don't think it was easy on anybody. But um, it was just kind of for me. It was that time, you know. I could I just I couldn't do it anymore. I needed a break. I needed to regroup, and yeah. I, a lot of it wasn't even about the music. It was um, it was about I had a lot of personal stuff. Just you know, all that stuff happened with my parents, and you know, and on the Oscars and all that stuff happened at the same time. You know, that my mother. Uh, passed away right before the Oscars and my dad right after that and like I never dealt with any of it I just stayed on the road constantly and we were touring and like I mean we were playing you know gosh over 250 shows a year you know and just like just, you're just not looking just back not even dealing with it I just I needed to take some time off and deal with all of that yeah personal think- stuff too and then kind of by the time I dealt with that and kind of regrouping and figuring out what I was going to do next it was just it was just some, a time for some serious changes in my yeah. life. You know? Yeah. Hey, fair enough, man. And then and then you go from, from you know, uh, sort of a iconic record label, Lost Highway, to mm-hmm. your own your own label. Now you, mm-hmm. I mean, that must have been a big. You got all this. <laughs> yeah, and add that on top of add it yeah, all. There was a lot of crazy stuff going on, and um, you know, the label stuff was. You know, a lot of people think that we. Um, did you know left lost highway or universal to do our own thing but it, it was really the other way around lost highway disappeared like they just it was part of universal and they just kind of did they away phased with it the out. they phased it out oh, wow. and so they were kind of it, we had it was our the option was either we sign on to another label within universal or we start our own you know and it's like well it kind of makes sense right. for us just to start our own label and right on the now. business yeah. side of that I mean, it, it it sounds like it makes sense to have your own label. Like, if you're yeah, producing music great. and publishing music, mm-hmm. well, then you should. And again, I'm, I don't mm-hmm. know the first or the last thing about yeah. the music business, but to own all your stuff. Mm-hmm. And we'd already been out grinding and out on the road for a while, so we had a fan base that we could go play to. And all we needed to do was really find a way to get in touch with our fans and let them know where we were going to go play shows. You and, know? you know, in the little bit I know about, forgive me for saying this but just country music but you know the country music country radio mm-hmm. is just such a machine right and, and they yeah. sort of they are going to decide who's who's going to make it and who's yeah not make you it. get tossed up around that washing machine like just and you don't get yeah. you don't you don't care I, I mean, maybe you do care about re- country music or country radio playing your music no, not really anymore. I mean, there's I've had I've, I have to say, I mean, I've had some really great support from right. from a lot of radio stations that play Americana kind of style music and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it's amazing that a song's ever got played on the radio yeah. and a lot of people. What, and what do you that, what do you make of not I mean, the, the machine of like the top 40 kind of. Yeah. Clear no, like tonight. I listen yeah, to like if I'm in my car, I have Sirius XM yeah. or satellite radio. I listen to a bunch of channels. But if you're going to listen mm-hmm. to modern, you know country music you turn on the highway 
Yeah, yeah. And you, you know, you hear what you hear, and mm -hmm. I mean, what's your take on? Because some of it I can listen to. Well, I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people that like it. You know, I guess, but I mean, it's it's not really ever been my thing. I've right. never been into it. You know, not even when I was a kid, really. I mean, I, I was. I mean, if Florida that, Georgia you know? Line comes on, you. Yeah, I'm not just, listening to any of that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> not, not one bit of uh, this it. This is yeah, funny. Yeah. This is, and I actually, I, 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 I like Dirk Bentley, but yeah. I like his music, and he's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. uh, we yeah. were at McConaughey's, Matthew McConaughey's mm -hmm. benefit, um, where they has this whole singer songwriter um, um, night. Where, yeah. Where, I don't know if you've played that. No, I haven't. You would, mm -hmm. man. You would slay that thing. I'm gonna sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> but. uh and and Matthew is very close with Jamie Johnson, mm -hmm. and so and Jamie and I, Jamie Johnson and I played Matthew's sort of celebrity, whatever you call it, golf tournament okay. that day, and and it was just hilarious. Yeah. But uh, so we were hanging out at the thing, and Dirk Bentley comes on, and and Jamie Johnson looks at me and goes, Lance, I do this for a living, and I'm not staying here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was I was like, motherfucker. Oh really? Yeah. It got it went there. It went there, huh? He's like. <laughs> I do this for a living, <laughs> and I ain't staying here. Yeah, and I was like, "It's gonna be like that." Get huh? your ass out of here! I don't blame you, go, <laughs> brother. I will. Where we just meet up later, whatever. I'm, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was, but I mean, I you can see that you know whether it's guys like you or Jamie. Yeah. I mean, that they, they they. I'm never, you know, I'm never. I don't really. It's I don't have enough time to care about it that much yeah you know that's, like it's, that's I've the healthy way to too do much it. stuff to do and like i you know i feel real thankful i get to you know people want to hear the songs i've been playing and singing and i'm i just got into it for different reasons i think mm -hmm. you know playing music and and on the road i didn't mm -hmm. get into playing music to become famous or become a rock star or anything like that you know i started writing songs first before i got into really performing or playing live for people i never had any intentions of it really even yeah performing these songs for people it what's the best really... song you ever wrote oh i don't know i mean i know that's a loaded question yeah. i mean like personal songs that have like a lot of you know yeah a lot of them are real personal and they're they're about things i've been through it's south side of heaven's one of the first songs I ever wrote that right song like every time i play it i still get the same feeling you know doesn't how long do you play a night well long you, like tonight how long you hour and play? a half to two hours well then go on earlier yeah <laughs> <laughs> this old man i'll be the dude with the cane walking well in. i judge the crowd too you know i can tell if they, right, well, if they that, want more we keep going if i think not, tonight we, uh, you, you, you're gonna you know, play for a while yeah. how important is willie to you willie nelson because he's very important i'm not a musician but he's very important to me as a friend really important to me that's in i think even i saw so you now. so i was at, yeah. at the wayland so this was last summer this was a year ago and i mm -hmm. we didn't meet there but i was at he he emailed me he's a, he's a prolific emailer mm -hmm. this old cat and so he emails me says hey we're playing this gig tonight come come down mm -hmm. and uh and um so y'all all played and then we were we were all back in the bus after yeah. the gig but everybody was in there i mean whether it's chris christopherson and, and yeah. jamie johnson and toby keith and and Chris mm -hmm. Stapleton and Eric Church and you rolled in and I think you, you whispered something to him, but you were kind of in and out and he's a great, I mean, yeah. such a special, special human. You know, I, I, and obviously he's a huge influence on me and everything that I do on the road today, I I do because of what I've learned from him, mm -hmm. like just the way that I go about just setting the whole thing up. But I really don't know him very well. Yeah, Like I've only kind of met him a couple of times on the bus and, it, you know, gotten so stoned every time that you hardly remember anything yeah. from me after you leave. You know, yeah, that ha that happens on the bus. <laughs> hey, that's his plan. You that happens. Get no, he, he's up. like, yeah, I've, I've <laughs> even just walking up. You don't even have to smoke any. You just will yeah. step on onto it. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, it's I mean, obviously I've listened to his music before I was even walking, and musically it influences me. The way he plays the guitar, I think he's still so far ahead of beyond you know time or whatever the stuff he plays on the guitar is incredible and he's Style. still and he's just still right and still at it like he's yeah. just ain't quitting I mean, well, he, that's he what was literally... a pivotal moment i remember this was probably four or five years ago i think it was even before the crazy heart stuff we did a tour uh, like a big month-long tour with him and we were in uh bend oregon and we we're it was an outdoor killer show. town it was pouring down rain i mean raining its ass off and 
uh, sold out show. You know, if you're in Oregon, nobody cares about the rain's not going to stop anybody from right. going outside. Everybody yeah. just put on the rain gear. Yeah. We're there. They're like, we're in Oregon. It's and raining. He no took shit. The, yeah. He took the stage and played almost two and a half hours of yeah. same night. And people were just like going crazy. And it was just a moment. I remember being on the side of the stage and like going like, man, this is it. Have you, you played know, with like, him? No, I've never played with him. Oh, we're going to make no. that happen. No. I'm going to make that happen. <laughs> All right. I am. You have to. It's and he's going to, you know, he's going to go down playing. Yeah. Fuck going down mm-hmm. swinging. He's going to go down playing. Like, he, he, I don't think he can, I don't think Willie can stop. Yeah. No, hell no. And yeah, I don't think so. This and last year we did with him when, when the Merle Haggard, thing, you know, happened. That was, uh, and with Jamie Johnson as well. Yeah. That was a tour that just was like, one I'll, I'll never forget the rest of my life yeah. just being in the being around him and it's not just him it's his whole crew you know bud rock and kenny and selman all and uh man it's just it's just the, all their whole kind of vibe the way that everybody treats each other it's just like man if you're gonna do this for a living and do it the rest of your life like that's how, that's right. how you do it you know? it hadn't been easy for him yeah. speaking of influences i know that guy clark was a big influence of yours and yeah. huge presence in austin i'm and it, that but again, I'm going to fully confess, I'm late to another party. Like, Guy Clark was like, I, so many of my friends were like, what do you mean you don't, you're not into Guy Clark? I was like, I don't know, I just haven't gotten into it mm-hmm. yet. And uh, I saw him live a few times in Austin, and, and I knew that his health was bad. And, you know, unfortunately, we all, especially, you know, you guys who were close to him or, mm-hmm. or, or deserve to have been fans of his, mm-hmm. we, we lost him recently yeah a few six months ago and what an impact i mean a guy that 99.99 percent of the world would be like who yeah and this is a guy that all you guys are like no fucking guy clark yeah he's the man he was you know guy and towns and um guys like joe ely and steve earl yeah. and robert rokeen those those texas guys were the biggest influence on me because they were writing songs about where I was from at the time, yeah. you know, and I and I started listening to them when I was real young. My uncle was a huge fan of all of the guys and everybody, especially, and so I, I was exposed to their music early on, and that was like even still today. Like if people ask me who my biggest influences are, it's definitely yeah. You know, and when I he passed, right you posted you, list, yeah. you had a you, it was a short clip because it was on Instagram, but yeah. you, you you played a guy. Clark song, and then I saw somewhere else on YouTube, or somebody sent it to me. The show down in Melbourne, mm-hmm. you covered a Guy Clark song, and mm-hmm. I know you got your guitar sitting over there, so I might yeah, let's be- do beg, one. beg yeah. you to you know, I, another. I, for a long time, I didn't really do a lot of cover songs, and um, just because I, I didn't I wasn't really good enough to learn many of them, I didn't feel like I did them <laughs> justice. But and I didn't do this one too because uh, there's a line in it where he says he's been to Spain. I'd never been to Spain until recently, so yeah. I guess now I can sing it. You're legit. You're <laughs> legit. legit. You're OG. <laughs> this one's one like guy. It's called the Dublin Blues. Well, I wish I was in Austin. Mm-hmm. Chili parlor bar, drinking Mad Dog Margarita. Not caring where you are Here I am, Dublin Mm -hmm. Just rolling cigarettes Holding back and choking back The shakes with every breath Oh, forgive me all my anger Forgive me all my faults There's no need to forgive me For thinking what I thought I loved you from the get-go And I love you till I die I loved you on the Spanish steps The day you said goodbye Well, I am just Poor boy mm-hmm. Works my middle name If money were the reason Well, I would not be the same Stand up and be counted 
me I stand up to the truth I walk away from trouble But I can't walk away from you So forgive me all my anger Forgive me all my faults There's no need to forgive me For thinking what I thought I loved you from the get-go And I'll love you till I die I loved you on the Spanish steps The day you say goodbye I have been to Fort Worth mm -hmm. And I have been to Spain and I have been too proud to come in out of the rain and I have seen David mm -hmm. Seen the Mona Lisa too And I have heard Doc Watson play the Columbus Stockade Blues So forgive me on my anger Forgive me all my faults There's no need to forgive me For thinking what I thought I loved you from the get-go And I'll love you till I die I loved you on the Spanish steps The day you said goodbye You won't forget it. <laughs> that is just amazing man like if i could just do that <laughs> what a gift what a gift thank you yeah i know he was important to you and i was and a, and a friend of mine a good friend of ours uh say he's the one who sent me that youtube mm -hmm. he's a big guy clark fan he yeah. sent me the youtube of y'all doing that uh down there down under and he was man it, it definitely it was i think it, it was his death was a lot harder on me than i thought it was going to be wow. like it just kind of hit and you know I, and I, I was sad but you know the next morning i remember just and when i was recording that song it was just like man it, it, it stayed with me for a few days for sure i remember i met him first time i met guy was with uh joe ely and a guy named terry allen i don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. terry but um you'd probably really like his stuff he's really well known for his art and sculptures if you like <laughs> art and but he's also an amazing songwriter and uh, Terry and his wife, Joe Harvey, had a, their wedding anniversary. Like every four or five years, they'd have their winter, wedding ever anniversary and just have a big party, invite all their friends to come down. And we were out in Marfa, Texas. Oh, and, we, uh, we can talk another hour about Marfa. Yeah. But keep going. This is this was in like, gosh, this is way before before I had a record deal, anything like that. And um, we set up in this old bar, Ray's Bar down there, and. I had it. He set up a PA, and I I got down there, and guy came, and Joe Ely, and Butch Hancock, and Jimmy oh, Dale Gilmore, yeah. and David Ro Royalty. Byrne, and singer Robert Keen, Royalty. and we just <laughs> played music for like three or four days in this little bar, and got to know Guy, and we did a radio show one day. I remember it was Terry, Joe, and me, and the public radio Clark, station. Yeah, yeah, Marfa Public Radio. Yeah, great Marfa station. Radio. Anybody at home yeah. listening, you can you can stream it yeah. online. Great station. Love yeah. Marfa Public Radio. And we're in there, and we're all kind of playing songs and telling stories. And guy was sitting in the corner, and we all had headphones on. You know, we're talking to Mike, and Joe's telling this this story. And all of a sudden, like the snoring comes over the oh. the the air over the radio, and everybody's headphones, you know, like just loud snoring. We all look over, and guys over asleep in the corner, just snoring into the microphone. Oh. <laughs> we just all died laughing. That's he never uh, let him live it down. Just but he got to do some really cool stuff with that guy. And his health, and his health was he slipped so much in the. I mean, people, you see oh, man. folks like he was that a fighter. Yeah. yeah, but then when you know, you gotta just, you know, it's happier now. You know, it must have been just miserable. Gosh, he had to have been in so much pain. Uh, you don't want to go on like that. Well, man, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you got a sound check, and it's just right, such yeah. an honor to to. I was so psyched when I got that email back, and then your wife emailed me, and then, and I was like, "Fuck yes!" I got Ryan on the podcast. And Thanks so, for having me, man. That's and I'm great. super yeah. psyched for tonight. We got a bunch of our friends coming with us. They're huge fans, I so I may bug you to 
say hi to them. But, yeah, of course. And um, they're going to be super, everybody going to be jealous that I got to sit here and listen to a couple <laughs> live songs. But uh, we're just super psyched. If the here. show wasn't so late, we'd come back to an after party. But hell, it's probably be two in the morning, three yeah. in the morning before we can get yeah. out of there. We'll I'd brain check on that. Yeah. Brain check. Yeah, we'll come play next time. Yeah. Dude, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Forward Podcast. Like uh, like I said at the top of the show, if you have anything you want to say, if you have a suggestion, please. God knows I need suggestions. Um, or questions or concerns or criticisms or whatever. Let me know. Send me an email. Send it to the Forward Podcast at WeDoSport.com. I know it's long. I know it's a little confusing. The Forward Podcast at We Do W E D U Sport Singular.com. The Forward Podcast at WeDoSport.com. 